so thank you for coming for my uh, talk on travel routers. Uh, this is something that I just found very exciting to work on. So my name is Michael Sosonkin. I'm a director of research and data at Synac. And Synac is a company that uh, leverages the crowd to find uh, vulnerabilities in our clients. So if you like discovering vulnerabilities, if you like hacking, uh, this is something that you might want to try out because it's, a, it's sort of a way to do real world vulnerability discovery and fight, <coughs> get uh, paid to do it. Um, so in the process of doing that, we also work on a lot of IoT devices and I had a problem. Uh, I found myself to be a digital nomad for a while and I was sort of moving around from an Airbnb to a cafe and I had to connect all my devices like laptops, phones, my wife's laptop and uh, her phones as well. And it's just, it became really annoying to do that. So I was trying to find something um, that would solve this problem for me. And so this was the motivation for uh, discovering a whole load of a section of devices that I did not know existed before this uh, called the travel routers. In fact, I have one right here. This is about the size of this device. Uh, there essentially, there, there are tons of them out there. I picked this uh, Hutu Travel Mate because uh, it is very reasonably priced. There are a whole bunch of reviews out there and people say that it is actually good for you. It's, it provides some security, it's very convenient to use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I figured, okay, I'll try it out. So I bought one, it, it was really useful. Uh, because I was able to have all my devices connected to it as uh, using Wi-Fi. And then I would just connect it to the cafe network, uh, the cafe Wi-Fi, and it would sort of just bridge the two together. Uh, it's small, good for travel, has a battery pack, uh, never catches fire. Uh, and it sort of gives you a little layer of protection. I, I felt a little bit of a warm and cozy because I was connecting to my own little network uh, using um, network address translation. So I thought, hmm, well, this is interesting. I, I like to hack things. Uh, does it actually make me secure? Or worse, does it make me less secure? And so I started uh, doing some analysis. Uh, first thing I did, of course, network scan, uh, see what services are available. Uh, I wasn't uh, surprised to find that uh, HTTP port 80 was open. And so this is for the admin interface. However, when I actually looked at the admin interface, I found that it had uh, two services responding to me. One was Lite HTTPD, which is very popular and I was very familiar with that. But the other one was called VS HTTPD. I was a little bit confused for a while. I mean, clearly there is some sort of proxying going on in the background, but wh what is this service? So I went out to Shodan, because that's what you would do when you are curious about something. Uh, and I searched for it. I found a few devices, not many of them are out there. Uh, I would expect that a lot of them are actually hidden behind private networks, so you wouldn't be able to see them. But there are still a few of them that kind of come up once in a while. Uh, primarily in the area of uh, Asia, so Japan, uh, China, um, I didn't find any North Korea, but there were some Taiwan devices. So I knew they were out there somewhere and there was some importance to them. Then I kind of turned uh, on, on the device itself and I decided to start reverse engineering it. First, I downloaded the firmware from the Hutu uh, main page. Uh, and that was easy, you know, you just click download. Uh, it would turn out to be a raw archive, which you can just extract. And what you get back is a shell script. And at the bottom of the shell script, there is a file system attached. Uh, it was uh, gzip compressed, but you know, that's trivial. Um, once I mounted it, I found that it was an XT2 file system and it had more stuff in there. And primarily there was something called the root FS. And I figured, okay, that's interesting. It's a little Indian squash file system. And um, that's kind of consistent with what you would expect with a flash-based device. So I mounted that, I looked at the configuration, and I found that it had this IOS service uh, in reference from uh, the uh, Elite HTTPD uh, config files. And I thought that this, uh, this is what was the, uh, the uh, VS HTTPD um, implementation of. 
So I didn't know what else to do. I kind of went around some more. I found a shadow file. I <coughs> saw the hash. I quickly threw it and joined the Reaper. I felt really, really lit with that one because it took about a couple of days to crack it. Uh, but I didn't know what else to do with it because I didn't really have a new place to use this password. Going online, I found that there was some research done on other devices uh, from Hutu, such as the original, the Titan, and the Nano. They're, they're all kind of similar in a way. However, I had the Elite and it didn't have Telnet uh, anywhere on the device. And I thought, hmm, what are the chances that the vendor would actually make custom firmware for each and every one of them? It's probably all the same and they just disable uh, Telnet on my device to make it a little more secure. And sure enough, when I did a search on the firmware, I found that it had uh, open telnet.sh script that would actually enable telnet on the device. But I still didn't have any way to run it until I realized that I could just fake an update of the firmware and I can tell it to execute this file and enable telnet for me. Uh, but I tr when I tried that, even though there were no signatures and no, no real validation done on this firmware, for some reason it did not execute. And I didn't really know what else to do, I just kind of continued on reverse engineering. Uh, throwing, throwing the iOS, IOOS service into IDA, I eventually found this uh, function called check firmware 2, which apparently does a, a checksum validation on the firmware that you upload. And of course there was no signature, nothing like that, and I said, okay, well I can just generate my own checksum. So I did that. Uh, I just put it up there and uh, the, f the firmware was, the device was very happy to accept it uh, and it just executed open telnet.sh for me. It said there was an error in updating the device because I did an exit one so it automatically means that there was uh, a problem. However, doing this action enabled telnet and I was able to receive a show. I was able to execute commands and essentially do dynamic analysis uh, download the debugger, attached to uh, any services, etc. So this was very happy news for me. Uh, in the course of reverse engineering, I also found that uh, the developer thought they were writing in C++ because most of the internal state was uh, in, the, in these structures that looked awfully like objects. Uh, there would be buffers inside, there was internal state, and it would usually be followed by function pointers um, right at the bottom of the structure itself. Uh, usually there would be initialization, they would assign function pointers to the actual um, to the structure, and when those uh, functions are used, every time it would pass in the pointer to the structure itself. So it is very much like the, this pointer in C++. So that was kind of cool. In and of itself it's not really a problem, however it, it just feels very hairy situation when you have uh, lots of buffers and function pointers on dynamic allocation next to each other. So immediately I thought, okay, well, what kind of memory protections does it provide? Uh, I found that it had uh, partial sp uh, virtual spatial randomization. So the binary itself and the heap were at, sta at static locations. However, the libraries and the stack were uh, at randomized, so they moved around. But there was nothing else, there were no stack canaries, there was no heap protections, and of course control flow integrity would be way too advanced for this device. All right, so then I started looking for vulnerabilities, uh, start fuzzing. Uh, I s kind of honed in on the F name uh, parameter of the get, um, get request uh, because I saw that F name was actually responding to me verbatim. Whatever I put in there, it would come back inside of an XML file. So I thought, I wonder what happens there. After about two seconds, I found that there was a, uh, a buffer overflow, and what was happening is that the developer was uh, copying the value of the parameter into a uh, buffer on the stack uh, using sprintf, which is of course an unbounded copy essentially, um, and uh, they, you know, it just quickly overflowed and I was able to control the um, return address uh, on the stack. So I did that and I was really excited and I thought, man, I, I have this vulnerability so quickly, I can just exploit it and get execution on it because I can control um, the uh, program counter. However, what I found is that even though I can control the program counter, I couldn't point it anywhere useful. I tried pointing it to uh, the main binary and the heap because they were static and I could, I didn't, I could predict those addresses. Um, but I had to, but those things were allocated on a low memory, so I had to 
uh, insert a null somehow into the string. Fortunately, I couldn't do it literally, and I couldn't use sprintf's own uh, ending null, terminator null, uh, for this address. That's because of this format string that I was using. Then I tried to use uh, uh, red to libc attacks, you know, see if I can point it to some gadget, or to directly to the stack because it, everything was essentially executable. Uh, those things move around, so I would have to have uh, some sort of a, uh, information leak attack in order to actually execute it. But I decided to move on. I started fuzzing other fields. Uh, for example, the cookie field uh, immediately overflowed for me as well. Um, and this one was a little bit more complex. This was a heap overflow. Uh, and what was happening is that the developer allocated one of those object structures, which was called CGI tab. Inside there was a buffer of 1,024 bytes. Now, in order to fill the buffer, they uh, would take the value from the cookie and just use stir copy, which was obviously unbound, and put it in there. Uh, immediately I thought, okay, well, if it's 1024 buffer, I will just send uh, 1036 bytes and overwrite one of the function pointers uh, of this structure. So I did that, and uh, about a 100 or so instructions later, this function would be used, and I was able to overflow and control EA, um, the program counter by uh, changing the function pointer of the structure, and immediately uh, when it would jump to that location, I could uh, uh, have the control there. Now, I was really excited about this because there were a lot less restrictions. It was a store copy, and there, were, there was no uh, format to deal with. So what I did is I actually pointed it uh, back into the, um, into the heap, uh, because that's where the uh, value of the uh, post messages uh, body was being stored. And the post message body is pretty much designed for any sort of data, so I could uh, insert uh, pretty much any value and I didn't have to encode my shellcode and I just um, was able to gain execution that way. All right, so now I can actually show you a demo of this. I thought, well, if I'm an attacker and I have this exploit, what is it that I can do? So this demo shows pretty much uh, everything that we've talked up to this point. Um, I was able to attach with a debugger, I was able to get Telnet in there, um, and then I attached with the debugging uh, client with GDB. So then I started looking for some coffee, I went to this website, and I thought, okay, everything's working, the device is fine. I throw the exploit, and now we kind of uh, just let, it, let the program run. We can see it's working just fine. Um, and then we see sort of the, the damage that the exploit has done to the device. So when I refresh the same website, uh, we can see that I'm able to inject uh, JavaScript and essentially demonstrate a man-in-the-middle attack. And the way it was done is basically execute an IP tables rules that allows me to redirect HTTP traffic to um, somewhere else, to some proxy that I've created. Now you might say, well, I mean, so what? It's, of course, it's HTTP, it's vulnerable, you know, it's all in clear text. Uh, doesn't everybody just use SSL now? Um, unfortunately not, I mean, uh, according to Google's transparency report, there are still tons and tons of uh, very popular websites such as CNN.com and BBC.co.uk that still use HTTP for a lot of portions of, the, of their website. And really, I just need one that will allow me to inject JavaScript in there in order to install keyloggers or uh, launch uh, browser attacks that way. Uh, so there are, there are multiple ways to actually exploit the router and to trigger these vulnerabilities. First is you can go through the XSRF. Uh, let's say if an attacker visits a web forum and there is uh, some sort of request that has an F name parameter in there. Now, I, even though I wasn't able to exploit it for uh, this demo, it doesn't mean that the device doesn't have any other attacks. And so if it was susceptible to other overflows through the unauthenticated GET requests, we could potentially do it without even being close to the, the device itself. The other option is uh, from the external Wi-Fi, you know, like I said, this is a travel router. It connects to all kinds of networks with questionable cyber hygiene in there, and so there could be already vulnerable to exploitation from there. Uh, and then, of course, from inside the Wi-Fi itself, 
you know, what if you connect an Android device that has uh, malware that specifically targets um, the infrastructure? For example, there was one called Switcher, which would look for routers to attack from the Android device. All right, so pretty much getting to the end of this point. So this was a lot of fun. I mean, th these vulnerabilities were uh, reported to the vendor and they were recorded in the CVE database. You know, the stack overflow was very easy to fix. Uh, just specifically use uh, SNPrintf, which is bounded. Or in more general terms, you can use stack canaries, which wouldn't prevent the vulnerability itself, but at least it would um, terminate the uh, attack vector and you, you wouldn't be able to take advantage of it. Uh, the heap overflow is a little bit, uh, a little bit harder to deal with. Uh, it basically just use a bounded string copy. Or you, you can also, in more general terms, you can try to encode your function pointers, uh, such as something that Windows does. Um, but unfortunately, as you can see here, the NSA has the patent on that, so we don't get to use it. All right, so why would somebody actually try to attack uh, travel routers or any sort of infrastructure? I mean. There, there are a lot of use cases for this. First one is uh, attribution obfuscation. Uh, you know, if I'm an attacker and I want to hide my, uh, my exploits, you know, I may want to blame someone else for it so I can exploit their infrastructure and then use that as a jumping point for my attacks. Uh, of course, stealing uh, user information, you know, authentic authentication tokens, usernames, passwords, pretty much anything that is unencrypted I can start uh, collecting from this device. And then also I can manipulate the user information. You know, you can, you saw in a, in a demonstration where I was able to inject JavaScript. So that means I can inject exploits. Uh, I can manipulate what they see, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and of, of course, the last one is uh, getting a foothold into other networks. You know, it's a travel device, so it's going to be touching a lot of different networks. You know, if I want to propagate as fast as possible, I may, I may try to use this device to launch attacks into, you know, Airbnbs, hotels, enterprises, or what have you. So I reported this to the vendor. They were quite happy to receive it. They said, hey, thanks for finding these vulnerabilities. However, our entire product team is off on Spring Festival. <laughs> I thought to myself, this is kind of cool. I want to be part of that. It sounds like fun. Uh, then it turns out this was actually the Chinese New Year. I didn't know this. And so this was like a really cool cultural thing to learn. Um, and of course, as soon as the Chinese New Year was over, everyone got back and they promptly responded by sending me a patched version personally, but not to anyone else. Uh, and about a couple of, couple of weeks later, after I noticed that it wasn't published on the website, I said, hey, can you guys like make this public so that people are not like, exploited by anyone? So they did. Um, they just said that their release cycle was a little bit slower than it is to, to send me an email. So that was cool. They were super nice about it. So what did we learn from this process? I mean, you know the saying, don't roll your own crypto. Well, I, I think there should be a saying that says, don't roll your own custom CGI web server. <laughs> Because those things are notoriously complex, there's a lot of work to be done, and there's a lot of uh, parsing happening in there. And so really, either get a lot of people, get a lot of eyes, or use something uh, that has been tested by the community. You know, vendors do respond. Uh, I had a pretty good experience in this case. Uh, if you can use something like OpenWRT, just because, like I said, it's, it's been tested and used by other people. Um, I mean, to me, exploiting routers is a lot of fun. I, I didn't know MIPS before this, and so kinda, it was kind of cool to learn all this process. And to be honest, I was really surprised that people still use stir copies and sprint tests, just like they did in 1999. <laughs> all right. So if you enjoyed this and you just want to chat about this, I mean, thank you for coming. It's been a real pleasure to be here. And if you have more questions, please ask ahead. And if you want to catch me in the hallways or online, uh, you can find me there as well. I, I love to talk about this stuff. Um, I will also put about four different articles on my blog describing all the processes I've gone through and more information about reverse engineering at debugtrap.com. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>